Hi folks, Johnny Laser here. This is a continuation of the discussion that we had after Bob Zeller's presentation on the 13th of February. You can watch the entire presentation by clicking the link in the description of this podcast. Do you know of any photographs or diagrams that exist of the inside of those cabins? Um, probably something is out there. Um, uh, I am not familiar with it. There are no... Um, photographs of the inside of the cabins that I know of um, from either series. That doesn't mean one won't show up. And if it does, because something new is popping up all the time, if not from our research, uh, you know, from the research, actual research trips, just, you know, popping up on eBay or somewhere. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, be uh, overly surprised if, if, if a new Hubbard photo, a new quote unquote, Hubbard photograph inside one of the cabins showed up. Well, now I, I got to ask one question before we go on to others. Now that we got Keith, we got Andy and yourself, between you three extremely talented uh, photo historian, brilliant guys, did there must have been at least one black stereographer. In other words, uh, you know, did you ever find any or, uh, you know, have you hunted one down or I, I, you're probably not because you would have shown them, but I'm, I'm just curious. Well, I'm sure it would have been in the North. Um, but, um, I'm, I'm familiar with JP ball, the black daguerreotypist, but I, I'm not, uh, they may know more than me on that. I'm not familiar with one. Are you guys 5, got your mics on? photographers. So I imagine, I, imagine in New York or Washington, but, um, Oh, but you don't think I'm, it, not, I'm not an expert on the uh, the guy who's given the lecture at the Daguerrean Society today, Ross Kelball, might be better to ask. He, he's doing a, an entire lecture on African American images, so not oh. that I, did, I did too. But uh, oh wow, should have got him in too. But uh, hey, hey, Bob, I have a quick question for you. Um, you had mentioned that the uh, Beaufort Museum has probably the most comprehensive uh, comprehensive collection. Is that available at all? Have they digitized it? Uh, yeah, I was looking for it today online. I think it's online. Um, Keith and Andy can tell me it's it, they're not at particularly high resolution, but I'm I, I'm certain I've seen them online before, so they should be accessible. But I was doing a little looking around today in preparation for the speech, and I couldn't find them readily. Yeah. Can you hear me? This is Keith. Um, yeah, Keith. Yeah, I, in. yeah um, they're online. Uh, it, it seems to move from time to time as to being able to find them, but but they are online. Yes, and I think they right. actually have they have fifty some uh, Hubbard and Mix. Keith, do you know uh, Mix's first name? No, I don't. No, I'm I'm not convinced that I'm not convinced uh, we have any idea what his first name is. It, I did see one source today, Alonso, but that it's that William Hubbard, and it's clearly yes. Erastus Hubbard. It, it, abso Hubbard absolutely, so. Erastus Hubbard. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure about that, Alonso. But that, that, that's kind of the thing we run into in this field. Is we, we might not even know the first name of the dang photographer. We have his photos, uh, or you know, ones he helped with. But and there are some just uh, labeled Erastus Hubbard. Uh, not all of them. Uh, he appeared to have been with Mix for a while, and maybe not for another period of time. Dave, did you have any other more questions that, that came up on the chat that you wanted to? try could i ask a question john that's tony here tony brown um bob what dimensions were the glass negatives the stereo negatives you mentioned um well as far as i know and, and keith and andy could chime in because i don't know that there's any um original negatives that still exist you know, I know that Alexander Gardner and Matthew Brady shot on four by 10 inch negatives, but their prints were, were uh, cut down, cropped down to three by three inch squares. There may be an unmounted albumin print by Hubbard, uh, Keith or Andy, do you guys know what size they might have used? 
Uh, no, but I, I think your, your estimate is it's got to be something in that range, Bob, because I mean, we, we have the prints. We know the prints are three by three inches, so it was at least that size. At least, at least three yeah. by six inches. Yes, so. yes. Uh -huh. well, but, the point being that that would determine the separation of the two lenses, which would, which might force on him the uh, ultra stereo that you would get, a hyper stereo effect. Because if you've got only 65 mil between them, but you're trying to take uh, contact prints off, say, a 10 by 4 glass slide, then you, your lenses are going to have to be further apart than the 65 mil, aren't they? So it'll give you hyper stereo by definition. Hmm. Is there anything in that? That's a good point. <laughs> I give you a cheer. You nailed it, Tony. How do you like that? <laughs> yeah. Welcome back. Now that, that really interesting thought process. Fascinating. A, a quick question on those cameras while we're on them. What would the what would be the price of one of those back then? Equivalency. You know, you come up with a number. Oh wow. Um, What uh, what do you think, Keith? Uh, I, I, Thirty dollars. Yeah, the lenses would have been the expensive part. The glass, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. You yeah. figure the inflation rate uh, in um, in 1861, I think, was about fifteen to one. Um, my, I don't know, stereo views um, mark marketed anywhere from twenty five to fifty cents. Um, so a single stereo view back then was somewhat in the same range as the cost of a, a CD today or a, a, a record album. Um, but anyway, um, I'm, I'm just totally guessing, but I would be guessing sure. 20, 20 to 30 to $50. And, and as Keith said, the lens would be a key. Yeah, yeah. The, the only question, the reason I was just trying to see the means of those photographers, what you know, because obviously they're entrepreneurial guys. They were trying to do this stuff. Now, normally, obviously, if they were a, a small company, they would own their own equipment. But if they work for something out of, you know, a, like a, a, a location out of New York or something like that, would they be given that equipment to shoot with and give it an assignment or they had to have their own gear? Do you know? Who who was they? Uh, the, photog the stereographers themselves. Well, and yeah, there works. was more than 5,000 photographers in the U.S. at the time of the Civil War. Only a few of them shot outdoor stereos for large for for marketing beyond the um i mean you know they they might be, be able to take s stereo for individual customers but but um not that that many um but but uh, until the blockade and even during the blockade uh, the top-notch equipment from the north from the anthony company was available to all and um and uh, in the work I've done on research on George Cook and his account books, uh, he sold equipment during the, the, the war, the, the blockade. He was not stymied. He, he invested in blockade runners and he was the major supplier of photographic supplies to other Southern photographers or a major supplier because his account books have the records of the, of the equipment and, and um, chemicals and stuff that he sold to at least eight or 10 other Southern photographers as late as 1863, which kind of busts the myth that there was no photography at all in the South. Um, but he had a he had a pretty good business going, um, selling this stuff. But just before the war, he was a regular customer of Anthony's. And in fact, at the request of the Anthony company, re provided them with the photograph of uh, Major Robert Anderson and his men holed up in Fort Sumter that everybody in the country was clamoring for. Uh, in the in February 1861, they were there from December until the bombardment in April, and and uh, Anthony Company had, uh, you know, requested ne negatives. So it was uh, quite you know a lot of commerce uh, from the north to the south before the war. But Southern stereo guys sold Southern st stereos to the south, and the Northern guys sold. Is that kind of how it laid out somewhat? Well, the the Osborne and Derbeck views are. are Kind of so rare in terms of finding prints that uh, I imagined that they were pretty much limited to sales to folks in the Charleston area. Um, after the war, some of the Osborne and Derbet pictures, including some of the Plantation series pictures, were 
the other uh, Southern photographers um, like Quinby and Noel got their hands on um, you know the negatives or copy negatives and made prints and sold stereo views after the war of the Osborne and Durbeck stuff. And that shows how popular they were, how you know historic. And um, they, um, but I don't think that any of the negatives still still exist still exist today. So pictures of slaves. Now, what, I mean, I obviously you can't tell from this aspect, but I'm I'm just if you had any opinion, who would be buying them? Why would you want them? I mean, if you were in the South, why would you want pictures of the slaves? It, 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 is it a, like a, just a a curiosity and the same in the North? I, uh, I could see one. I mean, they were souvenirs. Um, they um, advertised in the in the when they talked about the range of uh, images that the you know on Osborne and Derbeck were in business. They mentioned the plantation scenes. I'm sure pictures of Southern slavery would be um, interested interesting to people overseas visitors or really any visitors to the south um just like you know heritage tourists are interested in you know that sort of thing visiting you know old plantations or, or whatever today it was a distinctive you know part of southern culture then and now and um so if you wanted a, a charleston souvenir that um uh, was char you know was a South Carolina thing that photo those stereo views were definitely a possibility well particularly since the guys in the 1860 who were they again I don't remember all these photographers name the guys the guys in Charles Osborne and Durbeck uh, th those were the guys up they were shooting in, they did the actual plantation shots that we the original ones we saw the ones that correct the the uh, 1860 views in Rock Rockville so it's interesting. So that something drove them down there to shoot that, or well, and that's what one of the one of the breakthrough things about the article is. Um, I mean, we really didn't. You know, when I first saw these at Robin Stanford's home in the, probably in two thousand and two, um, we didn't really know much about them. And the, the question certainly comes up: Well, why did they go all the way to Rockville? You know, they had plenty of plantations much closer and much more accessible, and they did shoot in areas outside Charleston, like Goose Creek. And um, but the, the the passenger list with the name of the um, the brother of the plantation owner on the same vessel as Osborne um, would suggest that it had something to do. Maybe the the um, they requested it, or maybe that was maybe there was a friendship thing. It went beyond just shooting them for that family, though, because they did market them um, and advertise that they had, you know, plantation scenes. Were those advertisements in Southern papers and Northern? How, I'm not sure how that just, holds. Uh, just Charleston papers. I just mean, I'm Charleston not sure papers. maybe outside of Charleston, just Southern, and I think just Charleston. Well, that's fascinating. So now you have just just to, to finish up. Um, you said there was a new book or do something coming out with that Keith was working on. Or you guys are working on or something happening. What? Well, we have um, we have three issues a year of Battlefield Photographer. Um, I like to say we have an unpublished, unpublished on the printed page Civil War photo in every issue um, because they're they're not. It, we still keep on finding them. But um, Keith was the co-author of the um, Plantation Revelations um, article. And he's been hard at work now for some years, um, not only finding new Hubbard views, but doing what will be the definitive piece, certainly up till now, of Hubbard and Mix and these photographs on St. Helena Island and Buford um, in, in um, certainly in 1866. And I think it, they go back to 1864. So as I told Keith, it didn't have to feel any pressure because whatever he writes it will be the first treatment really of of uh, these the Buford photographers uh, Hubbard and Mix um, it's so and to gain access showing of their work so to get access to that you just join the um... yeah join the center and um, like I said on our website for free now you can go look at um, both Plantation Revelations by Keith Brady and Andy House uh, in the December 9, 2019 issue, and then Andy's article 
on Osborne and Durbeck, the first ex extensive article on these photographers ever published um, back in, uh, I think it's April 2015. Let me check. Yes, April 2015. We had an unpublished photo on the cover of that one of showing Osborne and Durbeck's photographic rig in Florence, South Carolina. Just a great. It, that we already had one photo showing their photo, you know, they're in the field dark room um, that, that was part of the Ford Sumter series. But, and, and then here we find another photo of this developing tent. In, yeah, it's, in it's very Mark, interesting. Like that's that, a cover photo on this issue and you can go look at it now. Well, that's what makes me curious that even that um, the photograph you had with all of their equipment in the shot, you would think these guys schlepped all that stuff out there. Would they have, why would they have taken the shot with this stuff in the shot? You know what I mean? Cause it, it's not like they were lazy. <laughs> they, they had a ton of stuff to bring out, right? Well, you know, the, the, the research we've done over the past 10 or 15 years, we just we find numerous Civil War photos with either wagon in the photo or photographic equipment. I think maybe sometimes it was intentional. Sometimes it just happened to be there in the foreground and they were taking something else and then they happened to be in the picture. Uh, I don't know that... Um, um, that Hubbard and Mix would have been necessarily intentionally putting that equipment there to be photographed. It was probably just there. They were taking pictures of the of the uh, the house and this group of um, you know recently freed freed slaves. But they could have put it there on purpose. You know, well, could you imagine there? Could you imagine the guy who's uh, developing it, and all of a sudden he goes, "Damn, we left the camera." <laughs> Which one? You idiot! You left it in. No, I, let's hope I, that I didn't happen. You know happen. That, uh, that, according to Rob Gibson, a, a modern wet plate photographer, that yeah, sometimes he has to run with the um, plate holder to the developing outfit from the camera, lest the thing dry and dry too much before he gets there. So they 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 needed to get it to the. Um, into the developer as quickly as they possible while the plate was still wet. Well, certainly with all of that, you realize the complexity of getting in on those locations, the complications that the people had who lived there, obviously they were slaves, and the complications of guys getting the equipment to those locations and finding, it wasn't as easy as taking 10 pictures and seeing the best one. You know, you really had to spend some time. That's why it's fascinating to me that that would be the, 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 the reasoning behind that. Well, I assumed for 20 years that, that they went by land. But I imagine it was a lot more difficult by land than just getting on a boat and going down to the, it obviously was. It, it should have been obvious to me. Oh yeah, well, he probably took a boat, but I didn't, boat. You know, I didn't know that they had steamer service to Rockville in 1860 from That's Charles. That's funny to say that. But a lot they of obviously had extensive steamer service all up and down the low country. Well, between you and uh, Keith and Andy and John, uh, you have just you left us better than you found us. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask real quick, Bob. Uh, are all the pictures in the magazine and online? Are they side by side as well as Anaglyph? No, no. Um, if you want to see them side by side, the best best place to go is the Library of Congress. Um, okay. You can um, um, search for Osborne Durbeck or uh, Hubbard, um, and they'll all come up. Or, or the you know Buford County Library. Um, generally, when we publish um, 3D fo photo in the in the journal, it's um, an anaglyph uh, because we can publish it larger. Sure. Um, but we do sometimes, you know, just to show the vintage view, um, publish the um, uh, the uh, view as a side by side stereo view. Generally, about at at full size. Um, very, very rarely will I use a, a stereo view as a half stereo. And if I do, I, I identify it as such. Well, Thanks. does anybody have any other questions? Then I will say this. We'd love to have you back. Don't, certainly don't, uh, oh, Andy, Andy's hands up. Is that a, do you have something to say, Andy? Oh, well, don't hold it against me that I both changed your name and moved you to Pennsylvania. You know, I'm, I'm, I just, you know, as happens to friend, you know, you know, I love I don't you. Know where you got Pennsylvania from. I've lived in about five states, but I no. was thinking of the, what, what was the, what was the big battle in there? Uh, what was it? Uh, 
the, the, the Pennsylvania, the you know, you know how much I know history. I fell asleep during fell, most of history. Uh, well, I don't know Valley Forge. Whatever. Well, one of those, yeah, that's what it. Is. It wasn't I, I even was, about Gettysburg. Uh, yeah, there was the one, Gettysburg, Harrisburg, Getty, it was a burg. I just had the wrong Gettysburg address. Man, I waited my whole life to use it, get an opening to use that line in. And I would love to have you back I, I, as much as many times as you would comply with my request. You're, <laughs> you're, and I'd love to actually do, you know, I'll, I'll reach out to, to Andy and also and Keith. I'd love to get you guys on a, a podcast. It would be it would be quite it would be quite interesting to we can we don't I, even need the views. Just your 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 your. your your history, your adventure, how do you find these things? And that would be wonderful for most people. And you may ins inspire other people to go out and do the same thing and, and be detectives like you. Well, the uh, the untold story here, I mean, because we only have room for a certain number of stories, um, but you can see it in Battlefield Photographer online in that 2015 edition that Andy just alluded to in the comment was that James Osborne uh, was born in New York and he's buried in Brooklyn. And um, he had a pretty tragic life. Um, and you can read all about it uh, in our Osborne and Durbeck article uh, in that April 2015 uh, issue, which I just checked and is online. So um, we have a little, you know, we have a little time left. And so I want to bring back, you were great. Oh my God, I, where's my, I, I can give you 10 cheers. I, I, I would hoist you up on my shoulder. Thank you for taking us back, man. And, and, for that wonderful time travel. I'll give you a real one now. Thank You're you. You're welcome. It's... And we, we will, I'll be in contact with you and plan more and, and thank all you guys for your hard detective work and bringing all this to life for us. It's, it's, it's a debt none of us can repay. Thank you. The piano has been drinking. The piano has been drinking.